Hello everyone. Let these last few get seated here. Thank you all so much for being here. Welcome to the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame induction ceremony for the class of 2024. Uh, some thank yous to get out of the way before we get going here. Uh, special thanks to our partners here from Imagination Station, uh, allowing us to host this awesome event here. Uh, thanks to everybody that is live streaming, watching this on BCSM. Tonight, we will induct five new members to the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame. These five gentlemen left their mark on this city throughout the years in different ways, and they are all still being celebrated here today. Before we get to the inductees for the this year's Hall of Fame class, I did want to recognize the back-to-back -back Riley Cup champions from the Toledo Storm who are in attendance for this huge weekend. These guys are all going to be coming out, and I'll introduce them right now. We've got Wade Bartley, Derek Booth, Rick Corovo, Mark Deasley, Norm Dezane, Ian Duncan, Dave Gagnon, Jeff Gibbons, John Henry, Alex Hicks, Jeff Jablonski. Rick Judson, Scott King, Scotty Lerman, Mark Lyons, Bruce McDonald, Mike Markovic, Chris McSorley, Jay Neal, Wendy Potomsky, Alex Roberts, Dave Sattler, Heidi Schlesselman, Andy Suey, and Nick Vitusi. Let all these guys get settled in, find their seats. Welcome, gentlemen. So, some of you might know, some of you probably don't. Uh, this group actually has an extra special meaning to me. Those days at the sports arena were where I fell in love with the game of hockey. I would sit up in the stands and I would announce the games to myself, and I'm sure I annoyed the heck out of everyone with an earshot. Uh, I'm not sure that you guys all even realize. Um, but the, you guys had a profound impact on me and so many in this city. Now, I do have some pictures that I wanted to share from the old days here. Uh, first off, after Diesel's game winner in 1993, my dad thought it would be a great idea to take me over to Consol Tavern to hang out with the boys. That's me and my dad and Dunk. And then uh, there's me and Diesel. Of course, we had to get one with the, uh, the, the guy who scored the game winner. And then uh, this one right here, I remember just before the parade started, Duncan Juddy actually called me up to sit in the car with him for the entire thing. And for a kid who grew up here in Toledo and fell in love with the game of hockey because of what your teams did, thank you. These are some core memories for me, and it's all because of you. Uh, you guys made a 7- and 8-year-old kid at the time feel pretty special in that old barn. So thank you guys all. It's really cool. This Hall of Fame was created to honor those individuals who have excelled as athletes, as coaches, and those individuals or staff members who have been fervent supporters helping to shape Toledo's hockey heritage. The nomination and selection of candidates is determined by the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame Committee, made up of former coaches, players, team historians, and media with the input of Toledo hockey fans. To date, we have inducted 27 individuals into the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame, which is visited by thousands of people throughout the year at the Huntington Center. At this time, we'd like all of you that are Hall of Fame members already to stand as your name is called to be recognized. From the class of 2016, it is so darn good to see Rick Judson here tonight. From the class of 2017, representing his late father, Chick Chalmers, is Bill Chalmers. <laughs> representing her late husband, husband, Paul Tantardini, is Ruthie Tantardini. <laughs> I 
I wasn't around for the gold digger days, but my dad, every story he starts is about Tanner. And I actually played against his son when I was in high school. And uh, yeah, my dad would tell me some fun stories of, of old time hockey with, with Paul Tantardini. And uh, how about Mark Deasley? From the class of 2018, Dave Falkenberg. Also from the class of 2018, Jim McCabe. There he is. From the class of 2019, Chris McSorley. From the class of 2021, Rick Corvo. And from the class of 2021, Nick Batusi. To distinguish the unique uh, history of Toledo, candidates are determined each year based upon the eras of professional hockey in Toledo. Five eras are represented in this process. The Toledo Mercuries and the Toledo Buckeyes are combined category. The Toledo Blades and the Toledo Hornets are also a combined category. And then the Toledo Gold Diggers, Toledo Storm, and the Toledo Walleye. We are thrilled to welcome the 2024 class into the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame here tonight where your legacies will remain for all of time. At this time, we'd like to welcome to the stage our president and CEO of the Toledo Walleye, Joe Napoli. I, um, I do want to start off by apologizing for Jordan's uh, slideshow. <laughs> it had actually started off with about 42 slides of all of his photos. From uh, We narrowed them down to three. Um, <laughs> And he's still upset about it. So, um, Neil Newcomb, uh, who's the uh, general manager, executive VP, <laughs> we, he has one fan, <laughs> um, <laughs> loves, absolutely loves this event, uh, works very closely with Dan on it every year, and he can't be here tonight. Um, he had uh, open heart surgery a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he is doing great. Um, <laughs> yes. And uh, we, uh, we, we miss him dearly. He is uh, just a, a person that, you know, uh, ironically has a huge heart. And um, so he's got that repaired. He's on his way uh, to, to feeling better. And uh, hopefully we'll see him back in about four to six weeks. So uh, he, uh, he's here in spirit for sure. Um, on behalf of the walleye, uh, of course, I'd like to welcome uh, this year's Hall of Fame class, along with their families and friends. Uh, we are so pleased that you are here. Um, we also want to welcome the 93-94 uh, Riley Cup uh, championship teams. Uh, thrilled that, sh that, uh, that you're here. Uh, stopped out to the bowling alley uh, this, this uh, around noontime. They had a lunch and they, they bowled and well, some would call it bowling. I don't know what the hell they were doing, actually, because it didn't look like bowling. But they did seem to be having a good time. So we um, got to meet a few of the guys there, and uh, we're very appreciative that you took the time to visit and come back to Toledo. Uh, it's very, very uh, pleasing to see how much you enjoy each other's company and that you're uh, renewing uh, friendships and seeing people that you haven't seen in 25, 30 years. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, I will make one note. We had the Gold Diggers back last year. Uh, again, repeat champs, back-to-back -back champs. You know, the Walleye have been in the finals twice. We've lost both times. And um, Steve Martinson, uh, those of you who know Steve, uh, made a point to point that out to me that the walleye have been uh, ousted from the finals twice so um, not only is he not on the Christmas card list he is never being invited to another event again <laughs> so um, so those uh, of you at the storm kid away but we'll never see you again a <laughs> um, couple of uh, piece of uh, pieces of advice for the inductees um, don't forget your spouse don't forget your kids um, it's going to be a really long night if you forget to thank them. Um, so do that first so you don't forget because you usually thank a lot of people and then you get to the end and we're like, oh, they blew it. This is going to be a long night. And then the other is 
um, everybody cries. You don't lose your man card if you cry, so cry, it's okay. Just don't wipe your nose on your sleeve because it just ruins the whole moment. So let the tears flow, get the box of tissues, you're good. Um, uh, as far as the Hall of Fame committee, uh, this is clearly uh, something that they love to do and they put a lot of effort into it and it's really hard. Um, so it's hard to narrow down the list each year to the few that get inducted. Um, and I know that they take it very seriously, they're very thoughtful about it, but it is very difficult. So uh, those of you who feel like you should be in the hall, maybe your day will come. Um, but we do want you to know that it is a painstaking process that they really give a lot of thought to. And, uh, and of course, congratulations to all of the inductees. Um, I have a Jeff Lurg uh, sitting down here in the front row. Uh, we had just hired Derek Lalonde, who is now the, the head coach uh, for the Detroit Red Wings. And I, don't, I do not get involved with player moves, any type of signings. We really leave that to our head coaches, who are really the head coach slash general managers of the team. And uh, Derek felt compelled to call me. And he says, uh, well, my first, uh, the first guy I'm going to sign is this guy named Jeff Lurg. And I said, well, that's great, Derek. Um, uh, thanks for letting me know. And he goes, well, he goes, you know, he, he won a championship at Michigan State. Um, he f frozen four, won the championship. He says, uh, mm, you know, they're trending in the NHL towards these giant goalies, 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, goalies. And he goes, you know, Jeff's 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, and he goes, I just wanted you to know. And then he says, uh, he's not 5'9", he's 5'6". <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay. And he goes, but he is going to be the most important person that I sign. And uh, I've never forgot that phone call. Then I had the pleasure of meeting Jeff uh, at our holiday party that first year. And it quickly, quickly became clear as to why Jeff was the first person that Derek signed. So I'm going to end on that note. Thank you for being here. Love that you're here. Uh, and uh, again, thanks once again. I also had my Ian Duncan game worn jersey I was going to wear tonight, but Joe said, no, you can't do that. Put a tie on. All right, fine. Got to do what the boss says, right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I am a big baby, you're right. All right, uh, let's get this ceremony kicked off with our first inductee. Barney O'Connell played for the Toledo Buckeyes and the Toledo Mercuries from 1947 to 1951 and was part of two championship teams. This year, we told each inductee with a surprise video. Dan Savick made the phone call to Barry, Barney's son, Tim, to deliver the incredible news. I wanted to show you this. This is your dad along with a couple of his line mates. He had an unbelievable career in Toledo. Yeah. He had such a great career that I'm pleased to tell you, Tim, that your dad is being inducted into the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame this year. Barney was a World War II veteran with the Royal Canadian Air Force based out of Manitoba. He was based in Manitoba because he couldn't fly because of poor eyesight. So as he said, he spent more time with a hockey stick and a baseball bat in his hand than a gun. Andy Mulligan, who was the coach and general manager of the inaugural season Toledo Mercury's back in 1947, recruited that area heavily. Barney was a star at the University of Manitoba, and then he went on to win the Manitoba Senior Championship. He was a really good hockey player, and he brought him into Toledo, and he came here. In his first season in Toledo, he was leading the IHL in scoring. He had 10 goals in 15 games, and then came January 3rd. January 3rd, 1947, a game at the Toledo Sports Arena. Toledo Mercury's, the Windsor Staffords. Barney goes into the corner. 
there's a big scrum ensues. He's punched in the chin by a Windsor Stafford's player. He falls backwards on the ice, cracks his head open. The arena went silent. They thought he had died on the ice. He was immediately taken to the hospital. In the next two days, he was twice given last rites. Surgery was performed. He survived. He was taken home by the surgeon and his wife who did the surgery for recovery. Barney O'Connell came back the very next year. In 181 games played for the Toledo Mercuries, Barney O'Connell had 92 goals, 118 assists, 210 points. He won two Turner Cup championships and two U.S. Amateur Championships in 1948 and 1951. Barney O'Connell ended up retiring from the game of hockey because he could not get a life insurance policy because of his traumatic brain injury. He later became a salesman of men's clothes at a department store in Toledo. When Barney retired at the end of the 1950-51 season, he finished as the second leading scorer in the International Hockey League. Andy Mulligan, who brought Barney O'Connell to Toledo, said that Barney was one of the greatest finishers he'd ever seen. He said, we pay for finishers, and Barney finishes them. Barney O'Connell is being inducted as a member of the Toledo Mercuries, and at this time we'd like to welcome Tim O'Connell to the stage to accept on behalf of his late father, Barney, who is the newest member of the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame. Thanks, Dan. I think you covered it. Dad, are you ready for this? Thank you. Thank you, Toledo hockey fans. Thank you, Barney fans. <laughs> to the back-to-back -back Riley Ch Cup champs and Hall of Fame inductees, it's my honor to be up here with you. Growing up in Toledo, Dad did not share his accomplishments with his kids. Oh, sure, there were clues. The dusty old hockey bag, the fact that all our relatives were Canadians, and we we're, were the only kids on the block who knew what a toque was. <laughs> we couldn't attend a sports arena event without somebody stopping them. But beyond that, we, we really didn't understand what all the fuss was about. Though he didn't, my mom did share an occasional beauty with me, like this one, one in which I'm, I'm not sure I've ever shared. Um, it was late in Dad's last season. She was expecting her first child, and she went into labor on the afternoon of an evening playoff game. Dad had a choice to make. He chose to play, <laughs> nerves and all. And he scored two goals both of them for the other team. <laughs> the following day's paper never reflected his miscues, but only mentioned how his goalie was screened all night, how his team rallied and pulled out the win. It went on to state that Barney's daughter, Shannon Patricia, was born at 9.30 that evening, sometime during the second period. I believe my mom's version, and that the sports writers showed him grace. On behalf of my sisters, Shannon and Terry, and our extended families, many of whom are here today, and those who are only with us in spirit, including my mom, B, brother, Tom, and sister, Sue, we are all so grateful for this evening. It's extraordinary that a game he loved, a team he loved, and a city he so loved would recognize him after so many years. The weight in many ways makes his evening more special. Almost everything we know about Dad's career 
is from scrapbooks, which I discovered as a young kid while rummaging in a hallway closet. For me, loving sports and being curious about my dad, it was like finding treasure, as I would pull them off the shelf when alone and just get lost in the stories. Yes, there were lots of articles about his, his and the team's accomplishments, but more than those, I eventually learned how important Toledo hockey was to him, and maybe a little about how important dad was to Toledo hockey. I learned that his rookie season, as you know, after a great start, he was involved in a fight, was punched, hit the ice so hard he cracked his skull, and hovered between life and death for a week. And he was given last rights twice. I don't, I don't understand what twice is. I, don't, I, I never understood that. He did recover, though, and was back the next season, picking up where he left off. But after four seasons, he would call it quits after his final, final, finest year in 1951. The fractures and other factors would eventually help him make the decision for his life insurance companies at the time would not insure him if he continued playing. I learned that my mild-mannered dad had a temper and took more than his share of penalties. This article described his play. During the second period, Barney O'Connell, the, the, the big Toledo center, suddenly seized little Bob Coop about the neck and squeezed and twisted it as if he meant to wrench off Robert's head. As a young kid, this was my scared straight moment. <laughs> Pretty sure my school grades improved after this. <laughs> I said improved. I learned he was a big attraction. The B.R. Baker clothing store and one of the Mercury's major backers hired Barney as a salesman during the off season and they would take out a quarter page photo ad with the invite. Boys, meet in person Barney O'Connell, rugged star of the Little Mercury's and our own clothing salesman. It was reported that boys lined up for blocks for the privilege. Heck, years later, buddies up on my block barely gave him the time of day. Am I right, Jeff, Tim, Rich? Um, heck, his kids barely did. But Barney would spend the next 25 years at B.R. Baker's. And I was surprised to learn five years after he retired that the Toledo Blade columnist announced my birth on the sports page. It read, a new hockey player on the local scene is Timothy Patrick O'Connell recently born son of Barney O'Connell, the old hockey player who turned haberdasher. Gee, no pressure there. <laughs> we all know how that worked out. Okay. He left us with so many treasures, but now we have a new set of treasures in this celebration that you've given us. To the entire walleye organization, Barney would be amazed at what you've accomplished and would be so proud Thank you for everything that you do to recognize the past while creating this Hall of Fame and a first-class organization for the future. We are extremely part of, proud to be part of it. To Dan Savig and the nine-member selection committee, thank you for your dedication, for remembering these pioneers, and for shining a spotlight on their past while creating this physical legacy. I know for you, Dan, it's been a mission and we are so grateful for your, for your contributions. <laughs> to Barney's fans, I understand the fan vote represented just a small lift to Dad's entry, but I won't tell Barney's fans that. I don't know how much the fan vote really lifted Barney, but I do know how much it lifted my mom and me during the past couple of years. Thank you for your love and support. My son Ryan asked me, what would Grandpa say today? He'd be 100. I think I have a good idea. In addition to those I mentioned, I'm certain he would begin with his wife, B, who joined him from Winnipeg and was always his biggest fan and supporter throughout his life. His story would be incomplete without her. He would want to thank the Gladio family for kickstarting Toledo Hockey with that $1,000 investment to join the eye not to mention for building the iconic sports arena. He would want to thank Dr. Rollin 
and Mrs. Keebler, the Toledo neurosurgeon who was credited for saving his life and his wife who took him into their home for convalescence after his hospital stay. He would want to thank his coach and GM Andy Mulligan who not only changed his life but the trajectory of his entire family for generations. And last but not least, he would remember and credit his teammates while sharing this honor with them. Jake Kernahan, his buddy and lineman, line mate, went back to several Manitoba teams. He had so many great teammates, many of whom joined him from Manitoba. Late in his life, I could get him to talk a little about his playing days, but it was still not about accomplishments. It was always him recalling his teammates and their off-ice experiences. He would beam as he talked about the guys and their locker room banter, the long bus rides, often followed by the late night card games, which seemingly always ended in hijinks and laughter. I can still see him chuckling over it. I'll assume there were a few beers involved, and always Jake Kernahan. Yes, Barney was a humble yet proud guy, a guy's guy who was quick to laugh and never knew a stranger, especially on a golf course. We kids could consider ourselves to have been blessed to have him. Dad played, called Toledo home, and continued to serve Toledo hockey, his family, and the community until he relocated after 25 years, which I know was one of the hardest decisions he ever made in his life. But he never looked back. He never showed regret. I believe people who dodge last rights twice seldom do. And now he's back in Toledo being honored with this induction. Thanks to all of you. Dad. I am so honored and privileged to be the first, first one to welcome you into the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame. Welcome home, Barney O'Connell. I feel so bad for everybody that has to follow that up. Good luck, guys. All right. Up next, a true legend of Toledo hockey. Claude Noel played for the Gold Diggers for three years and led the Diggers to the 1983 Turner Cup. He later came back to coach the Toledo Storm and eventually became a head coach in the NHL. Toledo Hockey Hall of Famer Nick Fatusi was the one to deliver the surprise announcement to Claude. Take a look. This is a fun call to make and, and I'm happy to be making it with you. So as you witness in the spring, we're very proud of the history of hockey in Toledo that you and your teammates and, and all the success they had helped create. Um, so on behalf of the committee that is made up of past players, coaches, media members and fans, it is my honor, my friend, in congratulating you and your induction into the 2024 Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame. Um, that's going to take place at the end of uh, end of January, and we'll be in on details with you about that. But uh, you join a great club of people that you know and and people that you oh. don't know that that help build, uh, you know, really the the bricks and mortar of hockey in Toledo. And uh, we're thrilled to have you uh, in into the Hall of Fame. Toledo, as you know, is always. Uh... Well, it's always meant a big part of my career and my my life. And anytime you can win a championship, as everybody knows, it's certainly special. It's a great honor, and I certainly appreciate it. It was the 1982-83 season. The Toledo Gold Diggers were looking to repeat as Turner Cup champions in the International Hockey League. Bill Inglis decided to bring back a familiar face, a familiar face to him, Claude Noel. Claude Noel and Bill Inglis were teammates with the Hershey Bears in the American Hockey League. Claude won a Calder Cup in Hershey. So Billy brings Claude in in the 1982-83 season. And what does he do? He turns in a season for the ages. During the 1982 season, Claude Noel played in 82 games. He scored 42 goals, had 82 assists. That's an average of one assist per game, a total of 124 points. In the playoffs that year, as captain of the team, he scored 18 points in 11 games. 
And when the team received the Turner Cup on the ice at the Mecca in Milwaukee, it was Claude Noel who accepted it and made the first skate around the rink. I feel fortunate. I think you guys worked hard. I think we really deserved to win. I thought we were the best team in the league. You know, we showed that over 82 games, but it's tougher to show it through a shorter playoff series. And, and we did that by uh, more power to the guys. I tell you, I think we worked hard. Deserve it. The line of Claude Noel and Dirk Graham was unstoppable. Unstoppable. Dirk Graham had 70 goals that season, most of them set up by Claude Noel. Dave Falkenberg had 51. As a line, they are ranked as one of the very best in the history of the International Hockey League. Claude ended up playing two full seasons and part of a third in Toledo. He played in 168 games. He scored 59 goals, added 145 assists for 204 points. That's an average of 1.2 points per game. In 2001-2002, the Toledo Storm failed to qualify for the playoffs. So they decided to make a coaching change. Dennis Holland was out, Claude Noel was brought in. Claude had served as an assistant coach with the Milwaukee Admirals in the American Hockey League. He comes in, he spends only one season in Toledo, but what a season it was. The team wins the Brabham Cup under his leadership. He wins the Coach of the Year Award in the ECHL. Toledo engineers under Claude Noel, one of the greatest turnarounds in the history of the ECHL. The team finished 47, 15, and 10 in winning the Brabham Cup. Claude's performance in Toledo results in him going back to Milwaukee, this time in the American Hockey League as the head coach. That very next season after his success in Toledo, what does he do? Claude Noel is named Coach of the Year in the American Hockey League and the Milwaukee Admirals win the Calder Cup. Claude's success in Toledo and in Milwaukee earned him an opportunity at the highest level of professional hockey in the National Hockey League. He went on to coach four seasons, first with the Columbus Blue Jackets and later with the Winnipeg Jets. At this time, please put your hands together and welcome back to Toledo, Claude Noel. This is a little well this is a little overwhelming I didn't think that many people would show up today but <laughs> my goodness this is scary this is my speech right here no that's my uh, room key right here <laughs> there it is <laughs> you know there's first of all I look at those clips and I look at this picture and I think oh my god who's that guy <laughs> you know when I came to Toledo before I get started, when I came to Toledo, I looked at that film and I was like 155 pounds and I was telling some of the guys that I played with during the year, uh, during those years, and I said, uh, you know, I wasn't a very brave player. I had some skill, I could skate, had some decent skills, but uh, I was, uh, I told them I was allergic, allergic to wood because I would never go in the corners. I had guys <laughs> like Falkenberg, Dave Falkenberg and Dirk Graham did all the work, you know, and I just kind of benefited from their work but I was allergic to wood. Anyway, you know, it's certainly an honor to be here, and uh, it's very humbling to, to think that uh, my career led to this. You know, when I, when I uh, well, first of all, I'll start off with a little bit of a story, because Joe had mentioned about make sure you thank your wife and your kids and stuff like that. So I get hired in, in Winnipeg as the first head coach. They had lost their team for 15 years. It, the team had moved to Phoenix, so they didn't have a team. And I was uh, coaching there with the Manitoba Moose, and I end, ended up getting, they ended up getting the team back. I ended up being hired as the coach, and this was just a circus, because it happened a couple of days before the draft in Minneapolis. And sure enough, we go into the uh, press conference where 
all this is taking place and in Canada it's a little bit overwhelming and it was just packed now I thanked a couple of people forgot to thank my wife and this was in 2011 and I've paid the price ever since <laughs> so I will start off to say first of all thank you very dearly to my wife because I think without a good support system I don't think that you uh, you really have a chance and we've been married over 40 years and she's been there to support me all the time You know, the other thing is I'd like to thank uh, Joe Napoli and, uh, and uh, Dan Savick and the, the whole board for taking the time to, uh, you know, to induct, induct me into this uh, Hall of Fame. It's a great honor, you know, and uh, I was a little bit fortunate uh, for a lot of reasons. And I'll, and I'll explain my, my route in my career through Toledo. I grew up in a small town in Kirkland Lake, Ontario, a mining town about 30 miles east. And um, when I grew up, I, I really wasn't into school. I, I really wanted to play hockey. There were six teams in the NHL. This was I was born in '55. That was a few years ago. And um, and I, I dreamed of being a player and just playing. And I ended up having a 13-year career both uh, in North America and in Europe. And I ended up wanting to follow that up with a coaching career. And you just don't, when you start off when you're younger, you just don't plan to, to turn around and, and think that one day you'll be in, inducted in a Hall of Fame, any Hall of Fame, you know. And uh, so I was, I was very lucky. But it, it's funny, I had played a, a five years in the American League and I went to Europe and it didn't work out and I was looking for a place to play, didn't really have a place to play. And I knew Billy English because I had played with him when I was 21 years old. We both got released from the... Buffalo Sabres got sent to Hershey and I rode down with Billy. He was 33, I was 21. And uh, so we, we ended up, uh, you know, having a relationship and he wanted me to go at some point. I didn't have a place, so I, I think he called me up and said, would you come to Toledo? And I'm like, uh, sure, you know, what, what's the situation and all this. And, and the, the thing that happened that year was, uh, well, first of all, when you do these things, when you play and you have success with cups or you have success with whatever it is you have, the coach of the year and all those other things, you don't do this alone. And there's so many people to thank. I mean, I look around and people that made an effort to come out here, you know, certainly I appreciate it as, as my wife Linda does of you guys showing up today, but you don't do this alone. And there's a lot of people to thank. I was lucky to play with very good players, and we were lucky to, to win some championships and stuff like that. But it's something certainly that you don't do alone. And although you may get the credit and you may be the one that's in the hall, the Hall of Fame, there's a lot of people that are responsible for that. But I end up going to Toledo, and you're trying to figure out where your career's going. I didn't know where it would go, and I just dug my uh, myself into this team. And I remember my first day skating around the rink. I, I had been in the uh, Buffalo Auditorium with the Buffalo Sabres in training camp, and they had a small rink. But this Toledo arena was unreal. I remember going behind the net before the practice started, and I was standing behind the, on the glass, and the net's there. And usually you have a distance between you know, your stick and the net. Well, y you couldn't put your stick down flat behind the net. There wasn't enough space. And when you're allergic to wood, there's nowhere else to go but in the middle of the ice, you know. And I thought, this is going to be unbelievable, this building. Turned out to be really good, but what ended up happening was we had a very good year. We ended up winning the cup. I ended up going back uh, to, uh, to Europe uh, I, as a 27-year-old. I, I played in second division in Salzburg, Austria. I was a player head coach. And that never worked out, and it came back and played again with the, the gold diggers uh, again, and then eventually got traded. Things didn't work out, and then went on again. And then I decided to get back into to uh, or to try to get, have a coaching career. But the year, uh, and then when I started to coach, I remember, you know, first of all, congratulations to the back-to-back -back storm team. And when I got into coaching, you know, the funny thing is, is I really got a, 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 there's a lot of people I say to thank, but I really got some help from Chris McSorley. Chris and I had played together with the Gold Diggers, and I called him up and I said, I'm in North Bay, Ontario. I'm making $8,000 a year. I've got two jobs, one at the beer store and one in the plastic company. So I'm working three jobs, and we've got two young kids. And I was an assistant coach to uh, the North Bay Centennials, a junior team. And I called Chris McSorley up and I said, Chris, there's one team that hasn't hired a coach yet in Roanoke, Virginia. 
And I said, any chance you know the guy? And he said, yeah, listen, I'll put in a call for you. And I said, soon enough, I, I got a call from Henry, Henry Brabham, who owned the team. And, and he called up and said, come on down, bring a suit. And uh, so we drove down. And I told him, I think this is what sold him on the job. I was in North Bay, Ontario. And he was in Roanoke, Virginia. And I said to him, I said, Henry, if you could just promise me one thing. I said, if you could just promise me that you don't hire anybody, I said, until I get a chance to interview, I said, if I have to walk to Roanoke, which would have been f four years, you know, <laughs> if I have to walk to, <laughs> to Roanoke, then that's what I'll do. And I think that, that impressed him. But, it, you know, it turned out to be okay. But anyway, I went on to coach, and then I went to Dayton, and then as an expansion team, and that's when uh, Chris got the team here with the, uh, with the Toledo Storm. And I, I'll tell you one thing. I don't sleep at night some nights because of that team or those teams it was two years of hell i mean we got beat up in here i go back to the sports arena and i'd wondered why we had only lost three games with the with the toledo gold diggers well i go in, i go in as a coach with the dayton bombers i'm in the visiting room which i'd never been before and i swear i swear there was one light bulb hanging hanging down it was like a bowling alley and i thought your bags had to be kind of you know, you almost had dressed in shifts, and you had nowhere to stand. And in the sports arena, if some of you guys remember, in the sports arena, when you walked from the ice up a couple of steps and then down in the lobby, and everybody was smoking in there, then you walked into the room. It's fine when you're playing for the Toledo team, but when you're coaching the opposition team, it's funny how quick they forget. You know, so I walk in the room and I'm talking to the team, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is wild. No wonder nobody wants to play here. You know, and no one is so hard because this this building, the players, this building was just wild, and so. After I'm done talking to them, I'm thinking, well, where the hell am I going to stand? So you closed the door, but you couldn't close the door. There was no ventilation. So you, I walked out in a little cubicle, and I thought, okay, well, let's just stand right here. Because you couldn't go out in the hallway. You'd get killed, or you'd get mugged, or you'd get, you know, <laughs> or, or, or either that, or you're, you're going to have a dart, because whether you smoke or not, there's enough people smoking them. <laughs> you know? so, so I thought to myself, well, here's a couple of doorways. So I'm in this little cubicle here. Here's, here's the room right here. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, that's the lobby. We're not going that way. So I thought, well, I'll open this door. So I opened that door. Well, this is all the boiler rooms and the furnaces. And I thought, it's 300 degrees in there. I'm not going in there. So I stood there and I thought, whoa, my, I can see why this was such a tough place to play. But anyway, <laughs> so that was part of my the start of my coaching career. And I went on and coached for a little bit. And then I was assistant coach in Milwaukee for four years. And I I was both an assistant and a head coach. I didn't enjoy the, the, the assistant part of things. It was a good way to learn, but they never re-signed us. I belonged to Nashville. I was with their farm team in Milwaukee, and we didn't get re-signed, and I'll never forget it. It's in my brain. We were at Home Depot, Linda and I, and uh, David Paul calls up and says, uh, sorry, we're not going to bring either of you guys back. And so I give her the thumbs down, and, I thought, oh. and my boys were just entering high school. One was in high school, the other one was just had been in for a couple of years and the other one was just entering so it was a, it was a tough time for us so mike miller who's here with this <laughs> with his lovely wife uh hired me to coach the team here in uh, with the storm and i thought well i'm ready to coach and i thought i'll coach this like i think an american league team would want to perform and so um we end up we had the affiliation with uh with detroit it was already in place and then what happened was that uh, i brought along the the team that fired me which was the national predators i thought let's get them as an affiliation so i got them as an affiliate and i got we had uh four or five guys from detroit probably four or five guys from from uh, milwaukee and we end up having 11 rookies in our team and really good team, r really good players, really fortunate to, with 11 rookies to be able to have success that we had. And as I said before, I think that the, the big thing is that there's a lot of people that are responsible for the success that you have. You just don't do this alone. But th the point of the story is that the two years that I was here after playing the five or six years and then restarting my career and going on and playing for 13 years and then starting to coach and then coming back 10 years after, I'd been in Dayton for two years and I moved up to Kalamazoo and so on and I end up coming back again 10, uh, you know, whatever number of years later and then in Toledo, both times I resurrected my careers through Toledo and I was very fortunate to have gone through this town and uh, 
it's funny today I drove around I met a lot of good people I'm going to try and keep it together here Joe because you told, you said this would happen <laughs> but the one good thing about Toledo among a lot of other things that there's tremendous people here and there's, there's a tremendous support system here and you can see it and I'm very appreciative of all that the people have done for me in my career and as I said you don't do this alone I'm very humbled and very appreciative of, of this honor and I'd like to thank you very much there's a water in there if you need it you've got one though you're good. I will never get tired of hearing old sports arena stories I, I actually suggested to our team we're like hey we want to make everything like it's a storm game for this weekend, right? So I said, well, maybe we just let everybody smoke in the building. Uh, we'll, just, we'll, throw, we'll just throw a bunch of like, juice on the floor so your feet will stick as you're walking through the concourse. I can feel what, exactly what it was like back then. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Joe. Sorry, Joe. All right, moving on. <clears throat> All right. Up next, this man needs no introduction to hockey fans in Northwest Ohio. He was a star at Bowling Green State University and later became one of the key pieces to the Toledo Storm, winning back-to-back -back Riley Cup championships. Ian Duncan is the newest member of the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame, and to pull off the surprise, we enlisted the help of his former teammate, Derek Booth. I just want to let you know it's been a privilege no, 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 to you guys. let you know that you've been selected to the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame, buddy. Thank you. You're freaking... Thank you. You're welcome, buddy. You're part of it, too. <laughs> You're part of it. Thank you. I'm, I'm passionate about the boys, right? And, and that's what hockey's all about, is, is, the, is the family that you build. Ian Duncan was a four-year letter winner at Bowling Green State University. He began his career at BG with a bang in 1984. The Falcons win the NCAA championship, and he played a key role on that team. But that role increased even more throughout his tenure at Bowling Green. He put up unbelievable numbers, and he went immediately upon graduation from Bowling Green State University to the Winnipeg Jets in the National Hockey League. During the 1987-88 season, he was named to the NHL all-rookie all team with the, with the Winnipeg Jets. Jets. Ian went, Ian went on to play 127 games over four seasons in the NHL, in the NHL scored, scored 34 goals and added 55 assists and a bunch of penalty minutes. What Ian Duncan, Ian Duncan brought to the table also made it very difficult for him to stay healthy. He played hard. He liked to play the body. He would go to the gritty areas to score goals and he would do whatever it took. He played with that edge but as a result, he suffered a number of serious injuries, including knee injuries. And if not for those knee injuries, Ian Duncan would have never played in Toledo. But Chris McSorley, he wanted to win a championship. The team won the Brabham Cup in 91-92. He needed a real stud, and he needed a captain, a leader, somebody that would follow in the locker room and on the ice. So he brought in Ian Duncan for the 92-93 season. And the numbers that Dunk put up were just unbelievable. He, he scored 40 goals and 50 assists in just 50 games that very first season. Oh, by the way, he added 190 penalty minutes as well. In the playoffs, 16 games played, 9 goals, 19 assists with 28 penalty minutes. Toledo doesn't win that cup that first season if not for Ian Duncan. Duncan back to Roberts now. Duncan out on top. Easy score! Mark Deasley scores the winning goal. The sports arena erupts as the Toledo Storm win the 1993 Riley Cup championship. Dean Duncan, congratulations on East Coast Hockey Championship. And Duncan gets the cup. Holds it high above his head from the penalty box and attempts to skate around the ice. Yes, folks, the Storm are the Riley Cup champions. Ian sat out most of the following 93-94 season, but he returned in time to perform his magic once again. Ian played only eight regular season games that 93-94 season, but put up 14 points. 
Then in the playoffs, Ian Duncan was Ian Duncan, recording 17 points in 14 playoff games, and once again lifting the Riley Cup, this time down at Dorton Arena in Raleigh, North Carolina. Ian also played the 94-95 season in Toledo. He finished his career in Toledo with 55 goals and 92 assists, 147 points. He did that in just 95 games. And of course, he was a stud performer in the playoffs. 48 points in 34 games played in the postseason for the Storm. growing up and now all these later, years later he's become a friend at this time please welcome back Ian Duncan A lot of them already had to use the restroom, I see. Um, that's from too much water intake. That's nothing more. So, and I know, I know uh, all the players and uh, people that know me. Um, you're going to take the under on me bawling. So, <laughs> I hope you took the under. All right. But I'm going to be short and sweet. Um, I'm basically here to say thank you. And it's already started, so <laughs> you win if you took the under. Um, there's just, um, well, first off, I, you have to, to the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame Committee, um, Dan Savick, just the amazing, the job that you guys have done, the Toledo organization, the walleye, the staff, everything, the hotel staff, everything is just, Mr. Napoli, incredible job. And uh, thank you for, from the bottom of my heart and uh, the other clowns up there, about 25 of them, wherever they are. But I just want, again, um, I'm just going to say thank you. It's been a privilege and an honor, just like Claude was saying, um, playing in Toledo. It's a special place, um, and I'm, I'm not going to mention Bowling Green a lot, Dan. Um, I know this is the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame, but uh, this area is like my second home since 1983. And um, who knew I would end up playing in Toledo? Because I know, I'll tell a funny, quick funny story, the dime beer nights on Tuesday nights, the gold diggers, um, <laughs> So we'd come up with five bucks in our pocket from Bowling Green and drink as many dime beers as we can to watch the Gold Diggers play. <laughs> so that was my first introduction to the Toledo Sports Arena, or as it's also known as the Toledo Sports Dump. And, um, but we say, that uh, we say that nicely because it was a special place and um, just like Claude was saying, um, the first time I skated in the Toledo Sports Arena was the year I signed with the LA Kings after my five years in Winnipeg. And I tore the muscles off my spine in training camp with the LA Kings. So I came back to Cleveland where I was living at the time, and I live there now, it's a funny thing. And um, I rehabbed my back at the Cleveland Back and Spine Institute for three months. And LA's farm team at the time was uh, the Phoenix Roadrunners. So I had called Chris and I uh, said, hey, they gave me the okay to start skating. Would you mind if I uh, come over and skate? Because I played against Marty in, in Winnipeg against the Oilers. And uh, Chris said, yeah, please, come on over. So I came over from Cleveland, skated for my first practice. I actually ran face first into the boards. Yes, I did. Um, the old, you know, you give the puck directly here, they gives it over the D, you turn this way, and I went flat right into those boards face first, and I'm like, wow, 
this is a small arena and I had played in Chicago Stadium also um, but it's just so Chris gave me the opportunity to come and skate I went back to Phoenix LA's farm team at the time and um, I had a first slow slow start no points in 10 games then I had 36 points in the next 26 games in in Phoenix and I was on my way um, back well back to the NHL or up to the LA Kings at the time and uh, I was supposed to go up on Monday and I tore my knee up on Saturday night another knee injury so but um, then after the knee injuries Chris reached out to me that summer and said what would it take to uh, play in Toledo and we talked for a day or two and uh, the deal was done um, but I just want to say it is a special place and the people that I want to thank the most and here goes the balling um, I want to congrat congratulate the other 2024 uh, inductees Barney O'Connell, O'Con Claude Noel, Alex Hicks and Lurgy Jeff congratulations you're not 5'8 I said that right away when he was saying that <laughs> very proud very proud man um, I want to thank Hmm. my mother my mother our mother um, my older brother Scott here played hockey in Notre Dame drafted by the New York Islanders but he is too big and slow to make it to the NHL <laughs> and, and thank you to my my game flourished for some reason <laughs> I don't know if there's a direct correlation or not but we'll leave it at that um, mom mom was a our mother was the captain of the Canadian uh, women's field hockey team and she trained her butt off and um, I bugged my brother <laughs> about not being so so much so talented or so much talented or whatever you want to say but we were given one thing from our mother and that was work ethic and that's one thing that in hockey you have to have the work ethic as a team not as an individual and being a leader on a team you have to be the hardest worker on the team you have to be the first one there last one out, out of the rink and I tried to do that. Sometimes that happened at the uh, establishments after the rink. <laughs> First one there, last one to leave. Um, but we were there every morning, um, ready to work. Um, the clowns that are here, and you all know who you are. Um, I see you smiling. Um, I can't thank you enough. You made me a better hockey player. Yeah, I played in the NHL big deal this team in these championships mean more to me than the lifelong dream of playing in the NHL and I've never had the relationship with a bunch of guys before and hopefully through my work ethic and hitting a lot of people scoring a few goals here and there um, we were able to bring a championship, two championships to the city of Toledo. The, the Moran family, I can't say enough. Um, the Rasmus family, a few people know who the Rasmus family is here in Toledo. Mark, Mark owned Tomahawk Development, died of cancer 15 to 16 years ago. And I first lived with the Rasmus family as I knew them from Bowling Green when I played for the Toledo Storm my first year. And I also want to thank my son <laughs> Brody <laughs> and Abby thank you for coming Janie and my granddaughter is she under there sleeping somewhere Bryn Lee okay but I just wanted to say as everybody knows in this room 
Toledo is a special place and we all know that and it's great to see I haven't seen some of these guys for 20 years but it's just like we uh, we got off the bus on Saturday night uh, from a long tro uh, road trip to Nashville um, it's funny how we always stayed in Nashville all the time <laughs> um, even though we didn't play against Nashville Chris <laughs> um, it's kind of funny Nashville was in the league at the time so we'd go on a 10-day road trip. We drive straight to Nashville. <laughs> We're going to Greensboro, Birmingham, and okay. So we went to we went to Nashville, and that that was our hub for the next 10 days. <laughs> we drove down to Birmingham, back to Nashville. We drove over to here, back to Nashville. And uh, if you remember the beautiful hotel that you put us up in, Chris, the planes, trains, and automobiles? <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to say thank you to everybody that is, is here in attendance, and especially to all the players that I played with when I was able to gain these championships. Um, I think there's, what is our D's? You said seven of us that were on both championship teams. So um, cheers to you guys. Uh, Juddy, glad to see you're moving around again. And uh, I'm sorry. And can we all raise a glass and a cheers to Barry Potomsky? His, his uh, sister is here. I don't know where she's at. There she is. Okay. Poto. Poto was a. Poto was one of the main reasons that uh, we won our championship and also why stepped on the ice. So again, thank you very much. Have a great night. Go fish. Don't forget all your stuff. Uh, you got to sit over here now. Yeah. When Dunk said he was going to keep it short and sweet, I was like, yeah, okay, no chance. When Dunk said he was going to keep it short and sweet, I was like, yeah, okay, no chance. All right, our next Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame inductee was also part of those legendary Toledo Storm Championship teams. Alex Hicks was also a huge part of those back-to-back -back championship teams. He would eventually go on to play more than 250 games in the NHL. We surprised Hicksy with the news and let his former teammates, Ian Duncan and Derek Booth, share the big news. Hicksy! What's up, dude? Hey, I got Dunk with me. XA. I just I just told him something pretty special and he wants to tell you something right now. Hicksy, I got a question for you. Or I got something to tell you. Alright. Just wondering. Are you coming to the reunion? Oh yeah. Would you like to be inducted into the Hall of Fame with me? Oh absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Hey buddy, congratulations, you've been selected to the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame, bud. Oh my god, that's with, the best. with this guy right here. We're going in together, Dark? Yes, yep. sir. Right. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yeah, I hey, sorry I had to lie to you a little bit about getting you on the phone, buddy, but... No worries, I appreciate it, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. Alex Hicks is unique. He's unique for many reasons, but perhaps what makes him special in the annals of ECHL history is that he was one of the very first players to help establish the ECHL as a proving ground of AA hockey, where one player can make the jump from AA all the way to the National Hockey League. Alex came to Toledo in 1992 out of the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire Division III hockey program. It was his first opportunity, although he put up great numbers in college hockey, to prove himself at the professional level, and he did just that. As a rookie, Alex played 52 games, scored 26 goals, had 34 assists, 60 points with 100 penalty minutes. In the playoffs, 16 games, 5 goals, 10 assists, along with 79 penalty minutes. He provided a nice mixture of scoring and abrasiveness, which was so important to that team. 
My name is Alex Six. When I score a goal, I like to churn some butter. On those rare occasions when I score three goals or a game, I like to do the taxi. Alex Six, only choice for Toledo Storm. He returned during the 1993-94 season as Toledo went on in pursuit of that second Riley Cup, playing 60 games, 31 goals, 49 assists for 80 points, and a whopping 240 penalty minutes. In the playoffs, well, that's where Alex Hicks really turned it on. 14 games, 10 goals, 10 assists, 20 points, and 56 penalty minutes. Those two seasons earned Alex the opportunity to perform at a higher level. He went on to the International Hockey League and was signed, finally, to join the National Hockey League. He went on to play nearly 275 regular season and playoff games in the NHL, recording 25 goals, 56 assists for 81 points. Alex spent time in the National Hockey League with Anaheim, Pittsburgh, San Jose, and the Florida Panthers. Hockey Hall of Fame, Alex Hicks. Is it hot in here or what? <laughs> I'm like sweating. It's, uh, it's supposed to be cold and sick. Well, thank you for having me. This is uh, it's a it's an honor. The other inductees, it's just to hear your speeches and your stories, it's been incredible uh, to be here and, and see all these old teammates and go out and have a couple of beers and reminisce about stories. It's been fantastic. Um, and Dan, you've done a great job. Um, obviously, being in contact with us and getting this all done, it's, it's incredible. Um, I kind of want to just tell you a little story. Like, you, you, you all know how the story ends. Like, in whatever, I w went on and did a couple things. Um, but coming here, um, the story was I, I, I came out of Division Three. I went to Washington Capitals camp and had dreams of playing in the NHL like we all did. And Went there, I scored a couple goals in like, not preseason games, but inner squad games. I'm thinking, this is, this is pretty good, I'm doing all right. And the first cuts come and I get cut. And I'm like, like what the hell? And um, I, actually, I was fortunate enough to meet Rick Corvo there and we played a little golf there, if I can remember, and, and he got cut. And so we're like, what's going on? And they're like, well, we want you to go down to Hampton Roads. And I was like, Hampton what? Ham like who? And they're like, yeah, John Brophy's going to call you. Or John Brophy's in the room, and he's, he wants to talk to you. And I'm like, it was all overwhelming for me. I, I went home, and I was like, I, I don't know. I talked to my dad, John Brophy, and Hampton Roads. I don't know. And then I just didn't know what to do. And I, I, I was a college graduate. I, I figured I'd start my life, and then Chris McSorley calls me. And I just knew him from his brother, and I didn't know who Chris was. And he's like, you got to come. you got to do this. you got to do that. It's going to be great, and blah, blah, blah. And sold me like only Chris can. You know, he... <laughs> so I was like, all right. Like, you know, so they got me a flight. It was like a six-legger from Calgary to, 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 to Regina, to Saskatoon, somewhere else. I don't know, then a bus somewhere. And I get picked up at a bus, and I walk into the, to the sports arena, and um, the first guy I meet is Greg Pahalski. And he's like, I think maybe 28, 29 at the time. I don't know. I, I'm probably dating him. And but yeah, beer belly. And, and, and so I thought, like, all right, so this dude's like works in the staff. And, and he's like, no, I'm, I'm your teammate. I was like, what's, what's going on here? Um, wh where am I? And um, 
So we walk into the sports arena and, and, and we're getting jerseys and getting equipment ready and doing all the stuff. And, and then McSorley brings me in his office. He's like, okay, you're here. And, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of guys. There's a tryout. There's a lot of guys in NHL camp still. Guys are going to be coming down. And I just want you to work hard and finish your checks and play hard and like, go hard and do what you're supposed to. You know, this way. And I'm thinking, dude, I just came from Division Three, And I'm a scorer and a playmaker. And I've never hit anybody or fought anybody in my life. And he's like, do this and do that and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I might have swore. I'm like, all right. And so we go out for the first scrimmage. And I'm doing what I'm told. Like, I'm very coachable. I'm like, so I'm running. I'm going north, north, just north and dumping it and finish. And I finish. And I finish. And I end up hitting this guy pretty hard. And then I go and pick up the puck off and I score a goal. And I hear from the stands, because McSorley's up on the stands watching it, and he's like, Patty, no, 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 Patty, stop, no, Patty, Patty. Well, I hit Patty Pillipuke, and he was going to come and beat the shit out of me. <laughs> and I was like, well, like, what's going on? What's happening here? And so the game ends, and I get in the locker room, and, and Patty, something happened, and he found out I was from Calgary. He's like, are you from Calgary? And I was like, yeah. He's like, oh. So then we became best friends, right? He's like, so I'm good. <laughs> I didn't have to worry about Patty anymore. So I'm th thinking, like, where am I, right? Like, wh what's happening? I'm hitting somebody and doing what I'm supposed to do. The guys want to beat me up. I've never been in the fight in my life. So we get an exhibition game a couple of nights later. Before I get my first shift in Toledo, before I get my very first shift, there's seven fights in the Toledo Sports Arena. Seven fights. I'm sitting on a bench going, what the hell? Why am I here? I went to college for a reason. I felt like Ned Braden in Slapshot. I'm like, what, what, what am I doing here? And I end up going out. I get a goal. I get an assist, whatever. No, like, no fanfare. Nothing happens, blah, blah, blah. I walked through the, you know, into the dressing room after, and we won the game, and, and somebody in the stands, as you're walking through, is like, you know, Hicks, you like your big pussy, blah, blah, blah. And, <laughs> and I'm like, what, what's going on here? Like, I scored a goal, I got an assist, I think I'm playing pretty well, it's my first pro game, and I'm getting no love. So, the next game we play, I think we played Louisville, I end up getting a fight, and I get absolutely pounded, and I remember Rick Corvo at the bar after, he's like, he's like, you were like Bambi, like your legs were down, and you were, you were ragdolling. <laughs> And I was like, dude, I've never fought before. He's like, oh, okay, you know, you know. So it, it was kind of humiliating, but when I got off the ice after the fight, the fans were like, oh, my God, Hicks, like, great, great fight, great fight. I'm thinking, okay, so if I score, they don't give a shit. <laughs> if I fight and lose real bad, they like you. So I, I kind of transformed my game a little bit. Um, so that was like my story here. Um, and to, to be a part of a program like this and be part of this team, a, a part of the city, it's all about the city of Toledo, to embrace that the hard work and tenaciousness and grit, it was incredible. And I relished in it. I loved it. I transformed my, my game. And because of this city, because of that, because of what they wanted from their players, got me to the NHL. And that's a fact. Um, if I just would have kept playing the way I did in college, I probably would have had a pretty good career. I probably would have stayed in the East Coast League, which is fine. But because I added that element of what Toledo sports fan demanded, I ended up making it to the NHL. So for that, I thank Toledo. Thank you so much. Um, you know, there's, there's so many stories. Um, I could tell you so many things, and I, and I don't want to go too on long. This is a few guys I want to mention. First of all, uh, Wendy Potomsky, uh, Barry's sister, she's here. Um, I just met her yesterday, right? Um, I got a text from uh, Andy Suey, and, he, and I'm the only guy at the bar responsible enough to go actually do this. He's like, hey, Wendy's at the, the hotel. Can you go get her and bring her? She wants to hang out with the guys. So I went, and so we kind of befriended each other, and um, he was such a big part of our first, our first championship. Uh, I was fortunate enough to play with him, obviously here, but in Adirondack, and, and then played against him in the NHL. And he was just a great player, great teammate. We all loved him, and he's missed. So, and thank you so much for coming.
Um, my roommate here, my first roommate, Mark Deasley, is here. We have a love-hate relationship. He, he loves to hate me, which is good. Um, we got into it a little bit today with bowling. It's a long story. But the goal was to get him really angry with me. And there's actually a video of it. We might put it up on a website later. He was really angry looking for me. Um, but anyway, you're, you're a great teammate, a great roommate, and um, I treasure those days that we had together uh, our first couple of years here. Um, another guy I'll mention, Rick Corvo. I haven't seen him in 30 years. Um, you know, technology, when you leave, you do things, you, you go on your way. I was able to become friends with his brother, um, Ivan, but a guy that I learned so much uh, about hockey uh, the, the first couple of years here, uh, his friendship, his leadership, um, how good he was as a player, um, it, it was really incredible. So I think you're, you're, you're an awesome dude, and it's great to be back. And I, I can say that a lot, about a lot of guys, but I, we have a special relationship. Um, I think you know that. Um, and so I'm really happy you're here. Thank you. Um, uh, two more, like, uh, number... Ian Duncan, like obviously, it's it's my pleasure, like an honor to be inducted with you. Um, we all know Ian's story. Ian took me under his wing like no other, as a player. Um, and I've said it in many interviews. If if I didn't play with Ian and didn't learn from him, I wouldn't have gotten where I got to. Uh, he was a hell of a player. By far the best player I ever played with at that time. Lemieux maybe is a little bit better at a certain point. <laughs> um, but he, he really, you know, a guy that had already made it and, and with the success he had and with college and pro and then to come back down and, and be with us and help a guy like me, it was incredible. It was, it was incredible. We were roommates on the road. Um, he taught me so many things on and off the ice. A few things off the ice I can't mention, but I did learn. Um, but how to hold a stick, how to, how to beat a goalie, how to, how to finish a check the right way, how to back check, how to play right uh, defensively, he, he was incredible. Um, so I'm forever indebted to you. You're like a great human, and uh, I wouldn't have done it without you. And that's the truth. Yep. Um, I got one more guy to talk about, but a real quick story. Um, the, the, the teams that we were with together, like, and, and I don't want to make it about those teams because there's other inductees here about you know different organiz uh, different organization, different time. But we just galvanized together. We talked about last night. We were like a pack of wolves, like a pack of wolves, and we were so tough. And one of the guys, John Hendry. He was a young guy coming from Lake State, young. He was a year younger than me, but that's kind of the way it was. And we, we just groomed that, that kid as, as a fresh kid to play hard. And he came, and he could skate, he could score. And we got him to play hard. And I'm like, dude, don't worry about it. Like, you got six guys, seven guys, every shift on your, that are going to protect you. And he learned, like, right away. And he became one of the best players on that team that we won because – what Toledo hockey players did, we just protected each other and, and looked after each other so you could go play as hard and as dirty and as mean as you wanted to, and you had your players around you. And so when I saw you today, I'm like, i got to put them in my speech because you were like a huge part of it, but when you first got here, you were like, you were like me. You reminded me of me the year before. So I'm glad you made it. Thank you for coming. Um, Lastly, uh, I, I got to talk about Chris McSorley. Um, when I was younger, I'd get emotional. I won't get emotional about it now. Um, but Chris saw something in me. You guys have all heard it before. Uh, he saw something in me that he, he knew I had more. And he pulled it out of me, squeezed it out of me, ripped it out of me, whatever he could. He did to get it out of me, and it worked. Um, he made me his captain the second year. Um, he, he was just an unbelievable coach to me. He, he's an unbelievable person to me. And, like, let's be honest, not everybody in the world loves Chris McSorley. 
Aiden, Aiden, it's true. Not everybody loves your dad. But I always say, like, he treated me so good. He treated me so good and was so honest and helped me so much that I definitely would not be standing here and I wouldn't have played in the NHL without him. Um, like, I'm forever grateful to you, uh, for you, Chris, for that. Uh, we have a great relationship. Uh, you were you're just a wonderful person to me, so I, I thank you for that. You guys can clap for Chris. And I was talking about the wolf pack mentality. Like, last night, every guy that we were out with was like, let me get this, let me get the round, let me get it, like, I'll pay for it, I'll pay for it. It was, like, such great. Everybody but Deasley did that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, so some, some things never change. Some things never change. I, I told you I was going to get you. I said I had the microphone tonight. Anyway, uh, I've taken up too much of your time already. It's, it's such a privilege to be here. I'm so happy to be here. I'm glad you all came, and I'm going to have a cocktail or two tonight. Thank you. You brought up McSorley. I actually talked to walleye head coach Pat Mickish yesterday. I said, listen, you will get this place going nuts if you pull a McSorley. Rip your shirt off, throw every stick on the ice. The place is going to erupt. And, and Mickish is just a real calm guy, so he's like, no, nah, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can do it. It's a different time. It's a different time, Chris. All right, our final inductee tonight was a key part of the turnaround for the Toledo Walleye franchise. He quickly became a fan favorite because of his small stature, as if I have any room to talk, and his acrobatic saves. We made the drive up into Michigan with Dan Savick to surprise Lurgy while he was busy at work. What's going on? How are you? Long time no see. What's up? How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm good. doing great. You're catching me in the work environment. We're catching you in the work good. environment. Uh, yeah, yeah. So as you know, we've had thousands of hockey players yeah. who have played in the city of Toledo. Yeah, yeah. Thousands. But only a select few are considered great. Those people who are great go into the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame. And we're very pleased and excited to congratulate you. You, Jeff Lerger, the newest member of the Toledo Hockey yeah, Hall of Fame. Congratulations, awesome. so congratulations. Yeah. Well, you know, Toledo's a special place in my heart. Uh, three awesome years. Uh, love the city, we embraced it. My daughter and my wife have seen my last game with the whole family, so that's my special place. I still have my final uh, leaving of the rink photo in my basement, so special place, I appreciate it. Couldn't be more honored, thank you. Bottom line is this, Jeff Lurg is a winner. Jeff won the national championship in 2007 with Michigan State University. He was an absolute stud in the postseason. He recorded a goals against average, a minuscule 1.25 with a save percentage of 954 in the tournament. Those are unheard of numbers for a netminder. He turned pro as part of the New Jersey Devils organization in Trenton, then went to play overseas. He came to Toledo as the very first signee of new head coach Derek Lalonde. Uh, he was the first player I signed and I wanted him because he is a very good goaltender but who he was as a competitor. Uh, I thought he could turn things around there, I thought he could drive us a more story. Uh, never in my wildest dreams. But I imagine how well it turned out. Jeff wasn't big. He was five foot six, maybe 163 pounds, maybe five foot six. But he was one of the most acrobatic goaltenders you'd ever want to watch. He played with a chip on his shoulder too, because he was so small. He always continually had to prove himself. But I also think that was something that drove Jeff Lurk to his success throughout his career. 
Jeff came to Toledo in 2014-15. He helped backstop the greatest turnaround in ECHL history. He finished that season first in the league and wins with 32. He had a goals against average of 2.37 and a 920 save percentage. That season, the Walleye went all the way to the conference finals after winning the Brabham Cup with the best regular season record in the ECHL. Every one of the postseason series went seven games. In 2015-16, Jeff returned. He finished first in the ECHL in wins with 28. He had a goals against average even better, 2.17, and a save percentage of .925. He was a second team ECHL All-Star in 15 and 16. He finished his walleye career, two full seasons and parts of two others, with a record of 63, 22, and 6, and a minuscule goals against average of 2.37. Jeff Lurg is known for many things. One of his most famous, the number one play of the day on ESPN. Look out the other way, two on one, Croc nose back, Mears in front, oh, wow. Jeff Lurg! One of the best saves you will ever see keeps this game alive. That save on February 14th of 2016, the two-on-one breakaway against Fort Wayne, created a buzz throughout the hockey world. This is why you have Hall of Fames and a true Hall of Famer. This is a guy that came in, um, took an organization uh, that was on the low, and it took it right to the top and hasn't looked back since. So. Jeff, this is well-deserving. Uh, I wish I could be there. Uh, you meant a lot to me in my time in Toledo, and congratulations. Jeff Lurg is going into the Hall of Fame as a member of the Toledo Walleye. Please welcome back Jeff Lurg. Love this town, only in Toledo. I refer to as five eight and five nine sometimes, but <laughs> we've clarified it. Uh, five five and a half, generally speaking, we'll call it five six. Um, but yeah, I love this town. So many special memories. Uh, so many special people in this room tonight. Uh, first and foremost, Dan and Joe and uh, Neil Newcomb. Obviously, first class organization and operation. Thank you so much um, for getting everything going and, and honoring me here tonight. Uh, to all those who are in the Hall of Fame inducted tonight and previously, and especially those who have won a championship here in Toledo, I am so jealous of you guys that you guys actually got the job done. Uh, gave me chills watching those highlights uh, from the second I arrived in this town. You know that that quickly became the goal was to uh, was to raise a, a banner here, a championship banner. Um, so that was uh, really the key of the inspiration. But uh, also amazing people in this room tonight, my, my family. You can see about 40 of us or 40 of my family members are here. Uh, as they did many times throughout my career, whether it's youth hockey, into junior hockey in Omaha, Nebraska, into college hockey at Michigan State, into uh, places both close like Toledo, Ohio, and uh, three and a half, four seasons over in Europe. My family followed me everywhere, uh, especially my wife, Laura. She gave up her career. Uh, I met her at Michigan State, met her in the elevator in the dorms. Uh, first year I was started a date, uh, we won the national championship. So being the superstitious goalie I was, I knew that uh, she, was, she was the one. Uh, my parents, uh, Ken and Jane are here tonight, my sisters Nicole and Stacy, all my aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, uh, everyone supported me along the way. You guys all made me who I was as an athlete and as a person. Uh, and as Dan mentioned, uh, I did have a big chip on my shoulder. Uh, when I arrived here, I arrived here at 28 years old. Love to fill you in on some of the details of what got me here because that's truly uh, what displayed my energy and passion, focus, and intensity uh, on the ice playing double-A hockey at 28 years old. Uh, I was diagnosed with asthma at four years old. 
I was always, obviously, as mentioned, the super short uh, athlete that was always a big dreamer. Uh, I grew up watching the Red Wings, so when I was probably 10, 11, 12 years old, it was finally the time the Red Wings got out of the Dead Wings era. They started to win Stanley Cups. And the goalies that were hoisting those Stanley Cups were guys like Mike Vernon, Chris Osgood, Manny Legacy, all smaller stature goaltenders. So that made me believe that I could play at that level. You know, it wasn't obviously the goal at that time. Uh, my dad played at Ohio State. My uncle played at University of Michigan. We were uh, a hockey family with a uh, high level of intensity and focus and dedication to that sport. So that asthma that I had at four years old, I from my second, first time I've ever played hockey to my final game, as you guys saw there, as I made my final lap, I had to do a nebulizer breathing machine prior to every skate. It doesn't matter if it was a pregame skate, a practice. Uh, it doesn't matter what town, what part of the country. Uh, I did it often on, on the way to the rink at times. And uh, that was a centerpiece of, of my athletic career. But as I mentioned, my, my support that I had throughout, that was never became an issue or, or an excuse. It was just part of who I was. Uh, so when I get to third grade, go to the eye doctor with my mom, and uh, we walk out of the room. Uh, she left balling that day after the doctor told us, well, Jeff's legally blind in his uh, left eye. So all his right eye does all the work. He's got to wear a patch if he wants to get that better. He's got to wear a patch uh, to improve it. No promises. We'll see what happens. So here I am as a little third grader. My mom has to come at recess first and foremost to give me a nebulizer so I can go out and play at recess. Uh, I have a patch on my eye, uh, only can take it off, of course, you know, to do tests and, and, uh, and uh, you know, at the evening to play hockey. And again, no one ever, you know, pitied me or thought that was an excuse. It was just part of who I was. So among those hurdles, and of course, you get to advancing in the youth career, I start to notice as I'm a teenager that even though my success as a youth hockey player was was fairly high for for you know where we were in Metro Detroit, we always had kind of a top ranked team nationally. I was always the starting goalie, winning state championships and and doing everything you're supposed to do. Started to notice that other goalies at that time started to get more looks in the junior level and even in the college level. So it finally kind of hit me, you know, they must not think I'm good because of my height. So. I went to Omaha, Nebraska in the USHL, uh, an awesome coach there. He told me a phrase that I'll never forget. It, it rose, you know, lived with me throughout the rest of my playing career. Uh, the coach's name is Mike Hastings. He's currently the coach at University of Wisconsin. He told me, if you think you're ready to play at the next level, you better dominate your current level. So to me, that's where that chip on my shoulder grew. It was right there. I said, okay, if that's the goal... I'm going to prove I'm going to dominate. So I took that quote, took that inspiration, took my background with my hard work, thanks to my, my dad and his, and his DNA he passed along to me, and I said, every year I play, I want to be the goalie of the year, and I want to win a championship. So lo and behold, next year I was the player of the year in the USHL in Omaha, Nebraska, and guess what happened? Did not get a full-ride scholarship to Michigan State. So I go to Michigan State to our visit. Uh, again, never forget this phrase. The coach, uh, Rick Conley was his name. Of course, I love him. He played me for 74 straight games eventually. But he told me, well, we can't tie up two full-ride scholarships and small goalies. And I said, well, it doesn't matter if you're short or tall as long as you get the job done. So again, that chip on my shoulder continued to grow. And uh, again, we spiraled that into a national championship and uh, was able to have a successful college career as an athletic and academic All-American, and I was kind of riding high. I, I got to the same point in my career where, you know, every time I thought or people told me I couldn't be successful, uh, I proved them wrong. So a couple weeks left in my senior year in college, I tore my ACL, first time I've actually had a major, major injury. Uh, I finished playing my final three games with a, with a torn ACL. I think I was just uh, pure motivation and passion and pretty blindsided on what, what took place. But uh, I did get, you know, a real minor league contract, uh, even though I had a successful career, and did get invited to an NHL training camp just to, you know, as an invite. 
three days before I left for that, I was going to go to the New Jersey Devils camp with Marty Brodeur and Kevin Weeks and Scott Clemenson. I was really looking forward to just seeing how I paired up against those type of legends. I tore my other ACL. So now here's this, again, super short goaltender that pretty much set every record you could imagine in college, but no one wants him. Then I go and tear two ACLs. Really no one wants me. At the time, my dad was being a good dad. He did what parents should do. I said, well, I think you should probably go get, go back to MSU and get a master's in finance. And I said, I am a hockey player. I'm going to find a way to make it work. That was the passion I had for the sport. And that's why eventually uh, when I arrived in Toledo, those passions connected. But So I worked my way through. I still had this, this drive to do what I you know, envisioned as a, as a youngster, play at the highest level I possibly could and continue to prove people wrong. So mixed in some time in Trenton, uh, went to Italy, had some more injuries, broken thumb, torn groin, things like that. Everyone in this room has gone through that as a player. Eventually, I found my way to France, uh, where a former coach, uh, he coached against me when I played in college. Um, he brought me over there, wanted me to be the starting goalie. I finally put together a couple good years of success, and that was the key connection, because after my two years in France, that person, his name's Rich Mitro, currently coaches at Shattuck St. Mary's, great human being. He was friends with Derek Lalonde. So they were chatting that summer. Derek had just come over, taken the job here. Uh, obviously, the expectations were to increase the level of play here in Toledo with all the history and passion and success the organization has previously had. Uh, obviously, Rich sang my praises to Derek, and then we heard, we heard the rest here. I arrived in Toledo. But that wasn't until I was 28 years old. So again, I'm 28 years old. I bounced around in the minors, had horror stories of travel, as these guys mentioned, playing in the ECHL, taking four train rides to get back on a bus, to go overnight, to go here and go there. And I still had that passion and that will to say, I'm going to prove people wrong. You know, I'm finally here. I'm back in North America. Uh, I want to show everyone I can play professionally at the North American League level. have no idea where it's going to take me. But when I arrived, my intention was, I'll just use Toledo for a one-year little stopgap. It's going to catapult me into the next level of play. And then all of a sudden we get to our first home game and it's a sellout crowd and I can see the passion of the city and see the passion of everyone in this town. And then it kind of quickly became, well, you know what, if I don't end up going anywhere else, I'm very happy to stay here. So that type of passion uh, was displayed on that ice because Toledo quickly became my platform to take all those hurdles that I had as an athlete and take all those doubters. And I thought every single game, I said, it doesn't matter who I play, where I play, when I play, or what I'm playing for, I'm going to bring it and I'm going to prove everyone wrong. And you guys can see from those highlights, I was very unconventional. I had to use every ounce of my body in order to make saves and find a way. But I didn't do it alone. Uh, we had an amazing team that year. I think it was 2014-15, probably the most selfless professional team I've ever been a part of. You know, when you get to the minor league, Levels, usually the extra 15 to $20 a week became a big deal for everyone. and Everyone tried to barter for more money. But Derek Lalonde found a way to get guys like me, similar at the stage of their point of career, late 20s, guys who had been, you know, had their chance and hadn't worked out. He got us all to be selfless. He got us all to believe in the team mentality. And then obviously success came and we fed off the energy of that town. And believe it or not, our first playoff series was not a sellout with the crowd. It was still a point in time when Toledo was slowly getting itself back, even though we were a first place team, into the passion we see here today. But uh, you know, some of the memories I have of having three straight game sevens, we always like to make it nail biters uh, for the fans. Those are some of the ones that'll that'll live with me forever. You know, I've never been. You know, when you're telling stories with friends and family, you don't often talk about losses. But uh, if you remember that season, 2014-15, uh, we got down 3 nothing in the playoff series. We made it to the conference finals. We are in South Carolina. They're a very, very good team. We got down 3 nothing in the series, and uh, a package arrived into our locker room. And Joe Napoli and management had uh, overnighted these T-shirts. And I think the percentage on the back said 2.2%. You know, so you're telling me there's a chance. So that was, that was the, the odds of, of a comeback. And 
you know, that was a special moment. The captain of our team, Justin Mercier, he looked at every single person in the face. He said, do you believe, do you believe, do you believe, do you believe? He went around the room. Every single person looked him in the eye. They said, we believe. We made it all the way back to uh, a 3-3 series. We won three straight, many of them thrilling games. Uh, we brought it to the Huntington Center in front of a sold-out crowd. Uh, it was a 0-0 game and a triple overtime. And finally, uh, Cinderella shoe dropped. But uh, it was one of the most memorable experiences in, in playoff rides and hockey memories that I'll have in my life. Uh, obviously, outside of a championship at Michigan State, it was, it was a special moment. Many good people were a part of it. And, you know, I look back and see how spoiled I was with my time here. I mean, my two coaches were Derek Lalonde and Dan Watson. One's the NHL head coach with the Red Wings. The other one's the head coach of the Grand Rapids Griffins. You know, we, we had Dan Jones, who's our strength coach, who put his heart and soul into, into preparing us like it was his life depending on it. You know, he made me feel like I was Jimmy Howard playing for the Stanley Cup. You know, we had so many great people uh, along the whole journey. You know, I, I did try my best to, to try to keep advancing my career as best I could. Unfortunately, uh, the only time I ever spent in the American League was a very uh, interesting day. It was a brief call-up. I had been called up a handful of times. Uh, I'd sat on the bench probably for 10 to 15 games uh, in my career, just going in for a day, opening the door, coming back. Uh, but the one day I'll never forget, one of the most proud moments of my professional career is that uh, with the walleye we were in Indy it was uh, I believe a Thursday night newsy Derek Lalonde called me in the office after uh, he informed me hey you just been called up to San Diego goals in the American League they're playing in Bakersfield you got to leave tomorrow at 6 a.m. so you're staying the night in Indy so as all of our hockey guys know you don't pack for a week you pack for a day and uh, there I was staying by myself in the hotel uh, in Indy, get up as you, you know, you don't sleep after a game. So mixed in probably hour and a half, two hours of sleep, early morning flight, get to the airport, fly from uh, Indy down to Houston, Texas, have a layover, Houston, Texas, over to Bakersfield, California. Again, only know one or two people on the team. Coach has no idea who I am. I'm just this little, you know, kid from Toledo. He doesn't even think I'm a professional. Um, get there, you know, you see the guys, pregame nap. I go and I watch the warm-up of the game. I prepare as if I'm going to play. And the goalie who was starting, I'll never forget, he had by far the worst warm-up I've ever seen a goaltender have. I think I think he let up 95% of the shots. So part of me is thinking, well, maybe this guy's a gamer. You know, that's kind of what, what he how he likes to operate. But uh, quickly found out uh, after it was one nothing, 2 nothing, 3 nothing, about four or five minutes in that he wasn't a gamer that night. So uh, about midway through the game, uh, after about – I'm finally, what, 30 years old now. Never played a minute in the American League. I think I possibly could up to that point to get a chance. Finally got an opportunity to go in and play my first minutes in the American Hockey League. Uh, 13 shots, 13 saves. Teams come, team comes back, makes it from a 5-1 deficit down to 5-4. Two days later, sent home, never to be back. But at the time, was I devastated? Of course. But it all led me back to Toledo. And when I look back on those stories, it was just part of my journey. You know, I, I did my best. I gave everything I possibly could. I finally had kind of had a going out party for my final game here after I battled some, you know, more time in Europe and a couple injuries, made my way back home. I thought my career was done. And uh, Dan Watson called. Uh, I previously communicated with him earlier in the year when he was the head coach. I said, hey, Dan, if you ever need a goalie to come down for practice, I'm getting over a hip surgery I'd love to come and be your practice goalie. You know, I'm just looking for some reps just in case I go and play. So uh, months later, he texted me. I think it was uh, about almost April, end of March. And he said, hey, Lurgy, we need an emergency backup. And at that point, I hadn't played a game in 13 months. I was getting over a hip surgery. And you know, I was still training. I was hopeful that something would pan out. And uh, so I go down there for the emergency backup. I quickly see the schedule and kind of see the goalie situation. It ended up being the uh, the last weekend of the regular season. And internally, I kind of came to the decision, well, if I can get a game here, you know, this would be it. And uh, Waddy did me a favor. He set me up with the final Saturday night home game uh, at the Huntington Center, sold-out crowd. Pretty much all my family and friends that are here tonight 
all made the trip down to see that final farewell. Got to have my daughter Scarlett and my wife Laura got a picture at Center Ice after the game. And there's no other organization where this stuff would happen other than the Toledo Hockey Organization. So I'm extremely proud to be a part of this whole evening, to be a part of the Hall of Fame, to be standing next to all these distinguished hockey players and hockey personnel. It's an extreme honor and uh, continue to come down for the years to come. So hopefully we're getting over the hump here for that next championship. So thanks again. I appreciate it. All right, that is going to do it for our ceremony tonight. One more time, please give a big round of applause to all of our inductees to the Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame. Also, a huge, huge thanks to our Toledo Hockey Hall of Fame committee and a special thanks to Dan Savick. I'm sure most of you know he puts his heart and soul into this event, so thank you to Dan. And we've got an incredible team behind the scenes who has put so much into this weekend to make sure that every little detail is perfect. So thanks to all of them. Remember, the weekend just getting started. We've got a huge celebration for the back-to-back -back Riley Cup championship teams at the Huntington Center. Also tomorrow night, we will unveil the new Toledo Hockey Heritage Hall inside the Huntington Sec Center behind Section 110. Make sure you stop by during the game to check that out. And again, thanks to our community partners for making this possible, and thanks to all of you for being here. We are going to have our Hall of Fame inductees available out in the hallway to sign some autographs just give us a couple minutes so they can take some pictures and then we will see you all over at the huntington center this weekend thank you guys so much good night <laughs>